This is a WSFA TV News special report. The Presidential Visit. Brought to you in part by City Federal Savings and Loan, by H&R Block, and by Gafers. Now here is Bob Howell. Good evening. A very hectic day for President Reagan is now concluded. A day that saw him blitz three states in a whirlwind tour to promote his new federalism. It was the first time that a sitting president had come to Montgomery to speak to state lawmakers, but it was not the first time that a president or a presidential candidate had come to the state. John Kennedy flew to the state during his presidential campaign. He met with then-Governor John Patterson in Huntsville. The year was 1960. The two national Democratic candidates, Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Kennedy came back after he was elected president. This time he returned to the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. He was greeted there by then-Governor George Wallace. This picture was made just as Kennedy stepped off the presidential helicopter in Huntsville. In 1971, it was Republican President Richard Nixon who came to Mobile. He was accompanied by family members Julie and David Eisenhower and Press Secretary Ron Nesson standing at the top of the steps leading off Air Force One. President Nixon was again greeted by Governor Wallace. The president was in the state to discuss plans for the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway Project. Nixon's visit attracted the state's political notables, as well as influential Republicans. The late Senator Jim Allen is standing directly behind the president as he bows to the crowd. Former First Lady Cornelia Wallace is to his right, and former Postmaster General Winton Blunt is also on the platform in Mobile. Richard Nixon came back to Mobile two years later, this time to be greeted by Wallace in a wheelchair, not many months after he was gunned down in the campaign of 1972. And eight years later, Democrat Jimmy Carter chose Tuscumbia, Alabama on Labor Day in 1980 to kick off his unsuccessful re-election campaign. When we come back, I'll be back with the story of President Reagan's visit to Montgomery today. The arrival of a president in Montgomery is quite an event for politicians and members of the local news media. But as Matt Carmack tells us, the arrival of the president in Montgomery was nothing new for the media that cover him every day. Maxwell Air Force Base looked like the scene of a reporter's convention as hundreds of representatives of the news media gathered to report on President Reagan's Montgomery visit. In addition to state and local reporters, almost 200 members of the Washington Press Corps came by chartered jet in advance of the president's arrival at Maxwell. These are the reporters that will follow Reagan on his road trip to three southern states to promote his new federalism. 
with the cameras in hand at the special media platform and typewriters clicking in a special hangar reserved for reporters, all waited for a chance to ask the president questions. We were all told that the president would not be available to talk to reporters because of his tight travel schedule, but as true gatherers of news, we all secretly hoped he might change his mind. This was not to be. Only minutes after leaving Air Force One and briefly greeting Governor Fob James and Montgomery Mayor Emory Palmer, the president, accompanied by members of the state congressional delegation, including Congressman Bill Dickinson, Senators Howell Heflin and Jeremiah Denton, stepped inside the special presidential limousine and the motorcade left for the state capitol. Mac Carmack, WSFA TV News. As the president's limousine moved quickly toward the state capitol and his 11 o'clock date with the legislature, dozens of groups opposed to Mr. Reagan's philosophy and budget proposals gathered at the King Memorial Baptist Church on historic Dexter Avenue in downtown Montgomery. The groups represent a wide cross-section of the population with particular emphasis on minorities and the poor. Kim Davis of our staff was outside the church where the protesters stayed because they had no parade permit. And the city council had denied their request to march during the president's address. Close to 100 members of the Coalition for Jobs, Justice and Peace assembled at the Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church around 930. Among the groups represented were the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the NAACP, the All People's Conference and the National Organization for Women. They sang anti-Reagan songs, carried anti-Reaganomics signs, and vowed to continue fighting the president's policies. Protesters also rallied in support of ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Dave Dismore has been riding his bicycle across the country supporting right, ERA. His destination is Miami, Florida. Dismore says through his travels, Americans have told him they want the ERA passed. I think we have an excellent chance. I'm a feminist, not a masochist. I wouldn't have started this if I didn't think we had a real chance of ratification. Then around 11 o'clock, when the president was getting ready to address state lawmakers, the group moved toward the Capitol, where they were met by Montgomery police who told them they would not continue forward. The protesters then continued chanting anti-Reagan songs. But the protest doesn't stop here. Members of the All People's Conference are planning a march in Washington later this month and in Knoxville in May at the opening of the World's Fair, an event which the president is also expected to attend. Because it's the poor people, uh, and the oppressed people of Central America that are dying in that war now that the United States is pushing. And poor people and oppressed people in this country are suffering because all our money is going to this huge military budget from all the social programs that people need for schools, medical care, education, uh, jobs, and you know, all the things that, that we need to work for over the years. They're taking and using, taking all that money from them, it's using to kill people in Central America. Group members say they'll be going to Knoxville for the opening of the World's Fair. That's May 1st. The president will be there, too, to kick off the fair. Kim Davis, WSFE TV News at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. While the demonstrators were gearing up for their protest, the president's motorcade sped to the Capitol, bypassing the Dexter Avenue Church by two blocks. The two official limousines in the caravan had been flown in the night before. The president's limousine tipping the scales at more than 12,000 pounds, heavily laden with protective armor. In the air, an Alabama State Trooper helicopter provided an aerial escort for the motorcade. As the president's car was driven to the rear of the house chamber, the helicopter settled to the ground nearby, standing by just in case. No spectators were allowed anywhere near the Capitol building. Most people who wanted a chance to see Mr. Reagan had to settle for a fleeting glimpse of the black limousine and little else. Inside the Alabama House chamber, state lawmakers from both the House and the Senate were jammed into the room waiting to hear what the president would say. Because it was officially a joint session of the House and Senate, the lieutenant governor, the presiding officer of the Senate, gaveled the session in and invited the president to speak to the legislators. The Secret Service had combed the Capitol building for days preceding today's visit. It was literally sealed off last night, with only a limited number of officials allowed inside the chamber prior to the audience being ushered into their seats an hour before Mr. Reagan's address. When we return, we'll have highlights from the president's speech. Stay with us.
The reception President Reagan received in Montgomery today may have been surprising to some, a Republican coming to a predominantly Democratic southern state, but also a state that was swept by Republicans in 1964, and a state that voted in a Republican turned Democrat for governor in 1978 and an outright Republican senator in 1980. Here's part of what Mr. Reagan had to say about his visit to Alabama and his mission. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for a most warm welcome. And if I may return the compliment, it sure feels good to be back in the heart of Dixie. Alabama has a serious unemployment problem. But I'm sure you believe the future is yours to shape, not just endure. The growth plan you're now implementing will pay tremendous dividends in the months and years ahead. Our administration can help, and we pledge to be your partner. I have great respect for your Governor Fob James, your mayors, your councilmen, your county commissioners, other local officials, and courageous members of this legislature who stand willing and able to accept their rightful responsibilities. We'll work together and build for the future. Our commitment to strengthen our defenses, increase spending on NASA-related projects, complete the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway, and move ahead with Enterprise Zones. to be the first United States President to stand before you in this distinguished chamber. If I may, I'd like to use this historic occasion to make a request of all those who lack faith in the American people. Come to Alabama. Come to Alabama and learn how a governor and state legislature took a Medicaid budget, $34 million in the red, and put it in the black while increasing services. Come to Alabama and see how concern for education and commitment to equal opportunity, including a war on illiteracy, consumes almost two-thirds of state spending and ranks Alabama fifth in the nation in spending on elementary and secondary education. Come and see how Alabama will take the nearly $450 million it received from leasing public lands and invest it in a super trust fund for the future. And the principal will not be touched. Then a general obligation bond issue is forthcoming to build roads, bridges, schools, and prisons, eventually creating an estimated 100,000 jobs. I think I understand now what Jeremiah Denton meant when he said, Mr. President, Alabama is the best kept secret in the world. You are not. The federal government should only do what the people cannot do for themselves or through their locally elected leaders. As one governor put it recently, we can no longer afford, either fiscally or politically, to have every level of government involved in the delivery of the entire range of public services. To put it another way, the buck and the tax dollar should stop at the closest possible level of responsibility. It shouldn't be automatically kicked upstairs to Washington, because for every step up, the cost of overhead becomes greater. We will return government to the governed. And we will not retreat from our program to give this economy back to the people who pay our bills 
and yearn to save for their future again. Last year, we put together a bipartisan coalition. And for the first time in half a century, we charted a new course for the country. We're coming out of a long night of government mismanagement and blundering, which caused this recession. Those who are unemployed are living a tragedy, and I want nothing more than to see them working again. But I'm convinced the course we've embarked on offers the best hope, and I cannot accept the idea that a program which is just beginning, and which in fact began after the recession was already underway, is somehow responsible for that recession. The solution is as obvious as it is urgent. Reduce government's share of the gross national product by slowing the growth of spending and help the economy grow by rewarding Americans who produce, save, and invest. Now, I think that's what we've begun to do. We didn't really slash spending. We just cut nearly in half the inflationary increase in spending, which was climbing at the rate of 17% a year in 1980. We reduced the growth of new regulations by a third, and we enacted a strong program of tax incentives. Now, critics charge that it's too large, but as I've explained, it barely offsets the built-in payroll tax increases that were adopted in 1977. Our tax program is just beginning. Most of the benefits will go to average citizens in your hometowns. The 25% tax rate reduction indexing of tax rates to prevent bracket creep and strong new incentives for retirement savings will provide major tax savings. Accelerated appreciated schedules for business, both big and small, will encourage the investment we need to make our products and workers more competitive. Productivity growth, producing more and better for less, is the basis for all real gains in wages and living standards. Most new jobs in America are created by small business, and most small businesses pay their taxes by the personal rates, not the corporate rates. So the personal tax cut will create jobs. Those who oppose it would only handcuff employers and further hurt the unemployed. We also address a special problem for farmers and family-owned businesses. It's not right that widows and children must lose just to pay Uncle Sam what generations of love and toil have created. So the estate tax exemption will increase to $600,000 by 1987. And of even greater help, there will be no estate tax for a surviving spouse, the widower or widow. Forgive me. And I'm not only proud of this tax program, I happen to believe it's the best darn thing that's been done for working and middle-income people in nearly 20 years. <laughs> now, I'd like to say something here to Main Street America, to the millions who work so hard to support their families and keep our country together but who sometimes feel like forgotten Americans. You know, we hear an awful lot about compassion and the guise of who has it and uh, who doesn't have it. Well, I believe that a safety net is essential for people who cannot help themselves. And I believe that most of us in this country have a real compassion for such people, for the most generous people on earth. But how about having a little compassion left over for those Americans who sit around the table at night after dinner trying to figure out how to pay their own bills, keep the kids in school, and keep up with higher inflation and higher taxes year after year. I realize that our cure for the mess we inherited is not always easy or popular or painless. But I must say this. It is an honest cure, not a quick fix. It's the only way we'll produce a lasting economy, a lasting recovery, without a new burst of inflation. We'll be back with more on the President's visit, including a private reception for Alabama Republicans.
Following his address to the joint session of the Alabama legislature, President Reagan attended a reception at the Montgomery Civic Center hosted by state Republicans. About 250 members of the Republican Roundtable, a group made up of heavy contributors to the GOP and special guests, were allowed inside the building. Don Phelps has more. Under heavy security, the president was whisked from the Capitol down Tallapoosa Street to the Montgomery Civic Center. People who lined the street to see the president got only a brief glimpse as his limousine sped to the rear of the Civic Center. The reception was off limits to reporters and the general public. Mr. Reagan was scheduled to be at the reception for 30 minutes, but because of his late arrival from the state capitol, he only stayed 20. WSFA-TV's general manager, Chuck Whitehurst, who was an invited guest, says the meeting was very informal. But when the president came in, it was almost as though he wasn't prepared to say anything. He got up and said, I don't have a prepared uh, text. I've already made my speech, so ask me what you want to ask me. Montgomery County Commissioner Bill Joseph says the president's economic recovery plan was a major topic at the reception. Well, he was, of course, that's very much on his, his mind, and he referred to the, the recession, uh, I mean, the um, uh, uh, inflation rate being down to around 3% last month and 5% uh, in the last four or five months, and the, the, the fact that his program is just now really getting in gear that uh, the, all of the problems and the things of the um, uh, high interest rates and all were, were, have been coming down since the program. It really didn't start the 1st of October that the program got in gear. From all accounts of the meeting inside, it appears the president left Montgomery on a positive note after meeting with friends and staunch supporters of his economic policies and his plan for new federalism. Reporting from the Montgomery Civic Center, Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. After that brief appearance at the Civic Center, the president was off once again to the airport at Maxwell Air Force Base. The president's party formed the now familiar motorcade and drove away from the rear of the Civic Center out Bell Street, which uh, was for all practical purposes sealed off to any other vehicles. And eventually the motorcade ended near the waiting jets at Maxwell. When Mr. Reagan's car approached the waiting jet, it became obvious that the presidential party was in a hurry to say farewell to Montgomery, trying desperately to stay on an extremely tight schedule that still would take them to Tennessee and eventually to Oklahoma. With only a brief ceremonial gesture of parting, the president went up the stairs of the plane and was ready to taxi to the runway and to eventually take off for Nashville. It had been a brief stopover in the capital city, almost two hours to the minute from the time Air Force One touched down. It slipped away from the camera platform, the photographers, the newsmen, and the politicians who were left behind to tell the news media what they thought of the president's remarks. President Reagan's fellow Republicans uh, had the expected amount of praise for his address. U.S. Senator Jeremiah Denton, Congressman Albert Lee Smith of Birmingham, and Montgomery Mayor Emory Falmer. I think the president today touched the heartstrings of all Alabamians and all Americans as he spoke about the virtues of thrift and hard work that made this country and what it will take to save it again. Uh, the idea that the government that is closest to the people is the best government and is one that is shared by many Alabamians and many Americans and I think that this was the thrust of his remarks uh, in support of his federalism plan which to most of us is just old federalism, the basis on which our country was founded. I think it was a, super, a superb speech, a tribute to Montgomery and a tribute to Alabama to have him here. And I think a wonderful day for the President of the United States. In Washington, you don't get quite the uh, mainstream God, country, family kind of uh, environment you get in Alabama, and I know the President needed that kind of a uh, a reinforcement. If we don't hang in with the direction he's given us and give it enough time to work, I think we are dreaming and missing our perhaps last chance for survival. I think we're going to confirm here in Alabama with our present governor and our future governor, our legislature, and our people that the federal government and the nation can afford for government to be handed back in terms of responsibility and authority and the means uh, through that special trust fund he referred to this morning to minister to the needs of those uh, who must be ministered to. Uh, we uh, do live in a great country, we live in a great state, and we have truly been blessed. And the program that the president has uh, in place now that Congress has voted for does take time. And as I've said in 
and uh, to the members of the uh, press in the Birmingham area, we do have to have some patience. Uh, unemployment is too high, and we have to uh, continue to take uh, steps to get this unemployment down and to get interest rates down. Interest rates are coming down, uh, not as fast as any of us would like to see them come down. But uh, we're heading in the right direction, and it uh, takes time, and regrettably, it takes more time than any of us would like to see it necessary in order to achieve the goals that we think are better for all Americans, all Alabamians. Uh, And that is it, an accounting of the visit of President Ronald Reagan. Historic, exciting for some, and perhaps an indication of where Mr. Reagan feels he has support for his new federalism. I'm Bob Howell, speaking for all of us at TV 12 News. Thanks for watching, and have a good night. This has been a WSFA TV News special report. The Presidential Visit. Brought to you in part by Jack Ingram Motors. By First Southern Federal. And by Alabama Farm Bureau. This program was produced by WSFA TV News.